All right, guys, so this video is about the biases. Uh, what we did was we tried to um, organize most of the biases that I've seen over the years on the USMLE uh, exams and the, and, the, and the QBanks and tried to focus in on those because if you look up the biases online, uh, there's just a, it, the list just goes on and on. So we tried to focus on the, the main ones. Uh, I want you to know the length time versus lead time. I want you to know the, the basically the confounding. So we cover all these in the video. Um, Hopefully it's helpful, and uh, let us know, comment, and don't forget to subscribe. All right, guys, so here's our attempt at the uh, biases. So let's get started. It says, a study was done to assess the relationship between attending a weekend seminar on how to get into residency and candidates' confidence when applying to match. Um, attendees who matched into their top choice, as well as attendees who did not match that year, were interviewed using a standard questionnaire. The study showed that people attending the weekend seminar without uh, their, let me see, without their chances of getting into residency, um, let's start that, increased after attending the weekend course. Okay, so long story short, they went to the seminar, and then after it, they felt like they increased their chances of getting into uh, residency after the course. The odds ratio is 2.2, meaning they felt there was a 2.2 likelihood or increased chance of them getting into residency after attending. And the p-value is 0 0.05, good, right? Because we want uh, p-value 0 0.05 or less. Based on the above information, what would be the most likely bias concern? All right, so essentially there, they, there was this seminar and, they had, and then they, in, they sent a questionnaire to these guys after the fact and one group of people who matched and one who didn't. So what kind of bias might that be? Um, so let's look at our choices. We have lead time, selection, Pygmalion, recall, Hawthorne, and procedural bias. Now, obviously some of these just flat out don't even fit, right? Hawthorne is that one where you're being observed, right? It's like, I know I'm being watched and it's gonna influence how I, how I kind of act, right? It's like they, they say that's the one where if it's a vitamin study, uh, their chances are they're going to start eating healthier and stuff like that. So um, we know that in this situation, it's not the Hawthorne effect because these guys aren't being watched. It's And then the Pygmalion effect, well, that's just e essentially saying if I set high expectations, you know, if there's high expectations, that leads to an increase uh, performance. All right, so that's, that's a, I mean, it's a good one. It's good for kids and stuff like that. You know, you set the bar high, people tend to meet that expectation. So we know it's not those two. Again, Hawthorne, somebody's watching you, and that, that affects it. Pygmalion effect, high expectations lead to increased performance. So now we're down to these three, lead time, selection, and recall, and procedural. Well, the lead time, I'm going to explain this one here in a minute. For lead time, for the step one and two and all that stuff, I want you to differentiate lead time from length time bias, okay? Those are your two that you got to differentiate. They're usually coming in the same answer choice. And for right now, um, lead time, and again, lead time is not for this one, but lead time has an E and an A, right? So I want you to remember the E and the A in lead is going to be used for early, okay? That's early detection. Early detection is leading to a bias that uh, people are living longer. But nope, you're just getting, you're just finding out that they're positive sooner. So a lead time bias, EA, is for early. And then length time, I just from you're gonna associate that with the word slowly progressing. They gotta give that to you. And again, the meaning that the length time bias is that whatever disease it is, it's a very slowly progressing disease, it gives the illusion that people are living longer. Well, no, it's just a slow progressing disease that you caught. Um, uh, so it's kind of a bias, it shifts the results a little bit. Okay, and just remember, big, big picture here is a bias is just, it's kind of a slant, you know, it's a slant uh, slant on the facts per se, okay? Um, so, back to this. A selection bias, okay? A selection bias means you're only choosing certain demographics or certain people, okay? And in this situation, they actually interviewed both, both people who matched and didn't match. So it's not this one, but again, selection bias is you're only choosing certain people, not that one. Now, a recall bias, okay? Recall bias could, could be affected here because the, this, um, this questionnaire may be influenced, right? The people who matched may be like, hey, man, I, I remember everything about that seminar, and that really helped me get, get the interview, blah, 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 blah. 
but the people who didn't match may not be so inclined to remember that that you know they paid money for some weekend seminar that didn't affect how they got into residency so in this situation it's the recall bias anytime that you do a questionnaire that's done after the fact there's a chance that you could have a recall bias in that situation and procedural bias this is the one think of like this at the end of a rotation you know you're supposed to fill out you know the attending does one on you and you're supposed to fill out some evaluation on the attending but the fact is you're under pressure right because you're thinking well what if this attending reads this and I know they say they don't read it for a little bit of time but what if they do read it you're thinking this could come back to haunt me so anytime that you're under pressure and you got to fill out like say an evaluation or some type of uh, give some type of feedback that's influencing how you'd fill it out that's called a procedural bias okay and I feel like I through residency I felt like that was one that we always kind of suffered from but in this situation recall bias questionnaire done well after the fact this one says a student researcher is designing a project that will hopefully minimize the use of confounding okay now I'll say this confounding's huge they like to use that word confounding bias uh, or confounders um, on step one in a uh, in, anyways, in, on step one exams confounding in a drug with exceptionally long half-life they report that using a crossover study would have some advantages in reduced confounding true uh, which of the following supports the students understanding of reducing compounding I should say <laughs> reducing confounding you think I do a better job rereading these um, so what would reduce confounding in a crossover study well first of all we got to understand a crossover study you know we start out like this you know you got one group up here one group up here one might be getting placebo we don't know um, and then all of a sudden they have a, this thing called a washout period where they just give them time for the drug to get out of the system right because if this if these people were on the drug um, we need them to cross to go through this washout period so then they can start the next phase whether they're going to be in the uh, placebo arm or maybe the medication arm they, nobody knows right so but this is there's a washout phase with that so that's a crossover study now and it does reduce confounding but in this situation let's let's see what it says is it a as patients proceed to the next phase of treatments there there may be carryover benefit from the prior cycle um, it's kind of true but we don't know if that really uh, would help help reduce the confounding here right because if someone's kind of influenced already uh, then chances are that might impact them on the back side of this uh, on the back side of the study because they're already kind of uh, you know trained per se and that might actually affect the results so I'm not too keen on that one a short washout period well this was a long half-life drug so if we have a real short washout period then the people who were taking the drug if, if they don't allow that drug to wash out of their system then it could carry into the to the second phase of the study so in that second phase may be influenced with that drug still in their system so we don't want to really in this situation a short washout period with the drug with the long half-life so I know it's not that one patient acts as their own control okay yes in a crossover study that's kind of the you know say the genius of the study is that the patient you know if, if they're the placebo right here and then and then they cross over and now get the drug or vice versa they act as their own uh, control in that situation okay so that's one of the benefits of being um, in a crossover study now in a, D says as the patient moves to the second phase they may be educated and not have to be rechained uh, no you know that that goes back to what I was probably explaining for a is that if they carry over anything from it they could be influenced uh, from one phase to the next phase and that could impact the results over here um, you know again with the same thing with that short washout period and that's maybe what a really stands for is that if the drug stays in the system they may be carryover benefits to the next cycle to or from the prior cycle uh, e benefits of an elevated type 1 error well, wait a second remember we, we remember all from our basics that a, a type um, a type 1 error is often as alpha error it's also known as the uh, p-value right there's no benefits of having an elevated we want that guy to be a low um, um, you know low p-value right so having an elevated makes no sense so in a crossover study it, they act as their own control now why did I even give this question because you're like wait a second and you were supposed to teach biases here 
Well, the purpose of this question is to kind of educate on how do we reduce, you know, how do we reduce the biases? And what you need to know is we, we can reduce biases by doing double blind studies. Okay, double blind studies. We can make our studies randomized. Okay, that reduces, and that and basically that will limit the uh, selection bias we talked about, right? Where you're only selecting a certain group of people. If we do it randomized, that re that limits the selection bias, and uh, you know, if, in the, on the double blind thing, that limits the observation uh, bias. Okay, and then we can do a crossover study, and the benefits of that is the subject or the patient is their own control, okay? All of these things will reduce the biases, okay? And that was the purpose of this, of this question. But know the, uh, the whole con con confounding we're gonna talk about here in just a second as well, okay? All right, so it says, when a group of researchers and students are trying to assess the relationship of birth order, whether it's first, second, or third, to the association of having a child with Down syndrome, a student argues that the age of the mother needs to be taken into, con into consideration. The researchers praise the student for pointing out the confounding bias, right? Based on this information, which of the, which of the following would be the confounder in this situation? Okay. So we, under, we have to understand what this whole confounder stuff is, okay? And think of it like this. If I do A, which is say, for our purposes, let's just think I give a drug, and I'm looking for some outcome, okay? Which is B, all right? And, and, and more specifically, we, we call this exposure. A, a is kind of the exposure, and then B is the outcome. Now what this is saying is that I can't just say A, I'm looking, I got A, and I'm looking to get B is that there could be this one thing out there, this one thing or more, that affects both of these. And we have to make sure that we understand that. Uh, because if it affects both, then we have to kind of, you know, when we look at the data, we have to kind of, you know, tease that out. You know, and you can tease it out. They do that through that stratus, uh, stratification, okay? That's kind of reducing that. But in this situation, what's going on? They're saying birth order. They're looking to do a study that talks about birth order and how it's associated with Down's uh, syndrome, okay? But we have this thing that, that, as the student says, well, what about the mother's age? Now, the thing is, does this, does this affect both Down syndrome, mother's age, and the birth order? Are, are they, is the mother's age associated with both? Because that's the real question because that's what a confounder is. It has some type of correlation or some type of, it affects kind of both the exposure and the outcome. So just by general knowledge, we know that the older the mother is, that there is gonna be some type of potential increased risk for Down syndrome. So yes, it could be associated with that. And we also know that when they're doing these calculations that the mother's age does impact birth order, right? Because obviously the mom's gonna be older when she's having the second or third kid than when she'd had the first kid. So it is associated with that. So this question says, based on the information, which of the following would be the confounder in the situation? Is it the birth order? No, birth order is gonna be the exposure. Kind of that, that's the exposure to this, okay? Is it the genetic loading of the mother? Well, I mean, it, it's good to know that, right? Genetic loading is kind of the, the, the history, okay? Sometimes we, in, in psychiatry, it's like, okay, we say there is no genetic loading or there is genetic loading, meaning someone else has that condition um, back in the family tree. Um, but they don't, we don't have that information here. Is it the mother's age? That, you're looking for a confounder, which would be the mother's age. It affects both the exposure and the outcome. So it's a confounder. How do we reduce it? We can reduce it by uh, stratification, okay? And that's the story for another day. The researcher and the student's preconceived uh, opinion on the outcome? No, what kind of bias is that? Like when someone already has an opinion about it. Uh, well, that's a confirmation bias, right? That's like, you know, it's just saying, hey, look, you know, I'm, I'm gonna do my own research on this. And I know I'm gonna get this outcome before I even start. That's a confirmation bias. The outcome of Down syndrome, nope, that's just also, that's just known as the outcome, okay? And then alcohol use or smoking that weren't mentioned? Well, they weren't mentioned, so I can't really, I can't really say that. It wasn't part of our question. But that's another example, right? You could say, they do a study where they say, look, I'm gonna study whether alcohol is associated with 
heart disease. And then the student would say, well, wait a second. What about smoking in this? We gotta take into account for smoking, right? Because is smoking associated with heart disease? Probably, right? There's some data to support that. Is smoking associated with alcohol? Well, if someone drinks alcohol, chances are they may smoke as well. There's probably a higher chance. So it's associated with both. So what's the confounder in this, in this study? Smoking, how do I reduce it? Stratification. And this one, it says, a <clears throat> group of students is working on a research paper uh, about a new detector for brain tumors in, adoles in adolescence. It is reported that these types of brain tumors are very slowly progressing. Remember I talked about that earlier. The students are concerned that this new detector may be impacted by the nature of the tumor's progression. Which of the following biases are the students most likely concerned with? Now anytime you see slowly progressing, you better be jumping all over length time bias, okay? Now remember, for step one, you better be differentiating lead time versus length time bias, okay? And what do we say? We said lead time has an E and an A, so that's just detecting something earlier. You know, it's not, and they're saying, oh, I think people are living longer. No, we're just detecting it earlier, that's all. They're probably, they're probably, they may be living the same amount of time. We just catch it earlier. Length time, they gotta have something in there that says it's slowly progressing uh, versus, versus something else. So they gotta, they gotta give you that somewhere in the question. The sampling bias is just filling, it's that whole deal where you fill out, uh, the filling out a questionnaire, okay? You gotta make sure that you're, you're getting a true um, representation of the of the population, okay, and sometimes this doesn't do it. Not if you're, you know, if you're in a very upscale neighborhood dealing questionnaires, it might not be indicative of your entire city, okay. Uh, that's a uh, that's a sample sampling bias. I don't know why I put the questionnaire thing because it, mainly in that it's just it's just not indicative of a population, okay. That's your take home point about with the sampling bias. The procedural is when you're filling out, you know, filling out an evaluation and you're under pressure per se, and that influences you about how you're gonna fill that out. That would be considered um, more of a procedural, uh, procedural bias. Again, you're under pressure and that influence you, influences you. The recall bias, uh, again, that's just, it's kind of like as time, time, from the event, you know, there's a question I, I've, I've seen out there where they talk about, you know, moms who delivered, um, had trouble with delivery. Well, the longer you go out from that delivery, moms are not gonna remember as much. That's gonna be more of a recall bias. And then the confirmation bias, um, it's like when uh, you do research, but you, but pretty much when you start to, to look things up, it's, you know, you're looking at data, uh, that is, um, or you interpret data upon your own beliefs, okay? So, you know, if I, if I already have it's something of intent in mind, I can kind of Google with certain keywords, and so I do that, and that, I do that and get my, the results that I expect, that would be a confirmation bias. And of course, the length time bias, we gotta go back, slowly progress, slowly progressive, lead time early. So again, a lot of these are just somewhat memory, memory um, but if I were you, I would understand what the confounder really kind of means, reduce it with strat uh, stratification, uh, or stratified analysis, I think it's called. Um, and remember the crossover study, have a good washout period, and the patient acts as their own control. And those, those are kind of your, your take home points, guys. So I hope this helps.